It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. After the podcast, check out our other episodes, all our Bible study resources, videos, download the CQ app, and more at ChristianQuestions.com. Today's topic is, Do I Walk in the Spirit or the Lusts of My Human Nature? Part 2. Coming up in this episode, being a follower of Jesus is no easy task because the desires of our human nature are obviously, well, natural. They don't just go away. They need to be dealt with. In our last episode, we began looking at the Apostle Paul's list of these challenges. Now we continue. Brace yourselves for a bumpy ride. Now, here's Rick and Jonathan. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rick. I'm joined by Jonathan, my co-host for over 20 years. Jonathan, what is our theme scripture for today's episode? Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Adam was created in the image of God. His physical human nature, nature was fashioned in a way that would glorify God by its very existence. Once he sinned, all of that changed. What was once a pure reflection of the heart and mind of God at best became a muddied and defective reflection. Fast forward thousands of years and we find God's plan in place to clean up this muddied mess. This cleanup comes through Jesus and his true disciples. Now, as Jesus' disciples, we're tasked with living above our muddied world. In part one of this series, we opened up with the Apostle Paul's reasoning regarding walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. We began examining Paul's long list of the works of the flesh in contrast with the fruit of the Spirit. Today, we continue this journey toward walking in the Spirit. This multiple-part series will identify what can keep us from inheriting God's kingdom and what can help us to inherit that kingdom. In Galatians 5, 16 through 25, the Apostle Paul intentionally contrasts walking in the Spirit with the lusts of the flesh. So let's begin by recapping the Galatians 5 scriptures where the Apostle Paul's lesson is found. So Jonathan, let's go to Galatians 5. Let's just start with verses 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please so paul has shown us here in these verses that walking in the spirit and following the deeds of the flesh are opposites and this is important they go completely separate directions so now come the lists jonathan galatians 5 now verses 19 through 25 and he gives us the negative list first, Galatians five nineteen through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul follows this up with a positive list, verses 20 through 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And you know, th there's such a, a powerful thought there. If we live by the Spirit, we say we do, then you have to walk by the Spirit. And that's what this whole thing is about, these big lists of contrasts. So first, like you said, the first list are the deeds of the flesh. And there are 15 specific deeds listed, and they are set up in five categories. And in, in verse 19, Paul says the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, and then he comes into the list. Well, in our last episode, we covered uh, the first category, intimate human desire, and that was in verse 19, immorality, impurity, and sensuality. We also covered the second category, which is spiritual control in our lives from verse 20, idolatry and sorcery. So now, where do we go from here? Well, Rick, in this episode, we'll be discussing categories three, four, and five, which is a tall task. <laughs> The third category is 
Interpersonal relationships, verse 20, enmity, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. The fourth category, group relationships, verses 20 and 21, disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying. Lastly, the fifth category, reckless behavior, verse 21, drunkenness and carousing. After Paul states examples of these categories of behavior, he covers anything he may have missed in verse 21, and things like these, of which I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, this is the message, folks, don't try this at home. That's what this is. And you're right, this is a tall task. These three categories, there's lots of negative stuff here, but we need to delve into it, define it, make it clear so that the fruit of the Spirit has its objective laid out for us, because these are the things we need to really be on guard against. So Jonathan, where are we starting right now? Well, let's get started with the third category, interpersonal relationships. This is taken from verse 20. There are four deeds, enmities, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. Okay. Paul's first two categories were about our closest personal relationships with one another and and, in our relationship with God. He dealt with human desire, and he dealt with our needed attachment to God as our only God. The apostle now expands his labeling of the deeds of the flesh to our personal relationships with those around us. So the next four deeds of the flesh focus on how we individually, now this is important, how we individually treat family, friends, the brotherhood, and others. So Jonathan, where do we start with all of this? Well, we need to pay attention to what is being focused on and what it brings us to. We will be repeating these phrases throughout our series. What is being focused on? Enmities. And its meaning is hostile, hating, and opposing another. To have hostility is to have a focus on oppositional feelings toward another, okay? Look, we all can have oppositional feelings, but hostility is a focus on oppositional oppositional feelings toward another. Allowing oppositional feelings to develop and have importance is how hostility develops in our minds as a basis for external actions. Hostility is in the mind, and it can easily lead to destructive actions. Let's look at Romans 8, 5 to 8 as an example of this. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, Rick, what jumps out at me is that hostility starts on the inside. And if we allow it to grow, it comes out in many ways. It can be seen in our facial expressions, our body language, in our words, and in our actions. It's in full display. Yeah, it's from the inside, but it can't, it has a hard time staying in there. And, you know, think about this Roman scripture that really jumps out at me. The, mind, uh, the, the mindset of the flesh is hostile toward God. It's against God. It's trying to subvert God. It, it's just not a good thing to have. And it's an internal thing that you're right. It kind of leaks out through in, in our lives, and we'll see what it, it develops in, in just a few minutes. Hostility is a powerful tool of rationalization. I feel such and such a way, therefore I can act on this feeling because it's my feeling, and it's my feeling, and my feeling is most important, and I'm angry, and, and that's where we end up with hostility. So, Jonathan, what happens here? What do enmities bring us to? A dead end of human, godless, and destructive thoughts and feelings. A dead end. That's what it is. It's a dead end, destructive thoughts and feelings. Remember, hostility is internal. Sometimes having hostilities in several directions can cause some to unite with those they may have been hostile towards by focusing their destructive thoughts on a common enemy. So what we're saying here is that you can have a situation where you have two people who are at odds, but they have a third person they're both at odds with, and they join forces to drip that hostility, that, that internal feeling. And this very thing actually happened to Jesus. Luke 23, 11 and 12. And Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. 
Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. Now, this is crazy, Rick. (laughs) Two enemies become friends based on a common cause, and look at the evil it produced the crucifixion of Jesus. And and think about the evil it produced. The most innocent man the world had ever seen was the victim of this combined hostility. Hostility is that internal anger and frustration and 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 negativity toward someone or toward those around us. It really is a deed of the flesh that we have to take care of. So so Jonathan, when we look at this, are we rising to a spiritual life? Or are we falling into human depravity? To have enmity is to harbor some level of hatred for another individual. Unless this hatred has a basis in love, hating the sin but loving the sinner, it represents seeds of mental and emotional destruction. Such seeds of this deed of the flesh will only produce sinful results. So hostility is a very vibrant seed. Is that a seed that we are cultivating? Well, Rick, I have a mirror question. And a mirror question, I want to look at myself and ask myself this very thing. What do I truly harbor and allow to develop in my heart? Now let's go to Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And again, that word for enemies is that same word for this hostility that we're talking about. So we've, we see that this is a big, big, big thing in our Christian lives, working against this deed of the flesh. So Rick, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome enmity? Well, we've got the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, they're listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and they're love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when we're looking at hostility and enmity, I think of peace. I think of having the peace of God. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said, and that should bring peace to any hostility that we feel. Because if he overcame the world, that means all things will be put back in their appropriate order when the time is right. No need to be hostile. Have the peace because Jesus overcame the world. So, Jonathan, as we put this all in order, this is a... (laughs) Every part of this podcast, Jonathan, is nothing good, okay? (laughs) We're not... Uh, Thanks a lot for this subject. Yeah, well, you know, anytime. (laughs) I, I always try to help. But, you know, the point is... It's important so we understand what these deeds of the flesh are. So when our thoughts and emotions go down the road of hostility, we need to take extra care to notice, process, and change direction. Hostility is never a basis for anything good. The question is, what does it produce when left to grow? As we've already seen and will continue to see, it's easy and natural for one deed of the flesh to lead us to another deed of the flesh. Because hostility is an internally functioning deed of the flesh, its natural expression will be some sort of outward action. It's only a matter of time. Of course, any outward action that has hostility as a motivation, that's an action that just doesn't end well. So we've begun, we put hostility on the table. What do we do with that, Jonathan? Well, let's go back to our third category, interpersonal relationships. They are enmities, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. So in this listing of the deeds of the flesh, this third category that you keep bringing us to, uh, it's regarding interpersonal relationships, my relationship with, with others. Paul has listed four deeds of the flesh here. And as we'll see, the first two and the last two go together as causes and effects. We just talked about hostility as a cause. Its effect is manifest in strife. What is being focused on? Strife. And strife means a quarreling, that is, by implication, wrangling, a contention. So I have a question, Rick. Can we disagree with someone without strife? You know, I certainly hope so. We should be able to, and, and I will tell you that sometimes in our, in our, in our Bible studies on, on our Sunday group, we have different perspectives on things, and it's a really, really great study 
when we sit and we say, okay, there's different perspectives. Let's hear from brother or sister so-and-so. Now let's hear from brother or sister so-and-so. Okay, you see there's differences. Any questions, any comments? And there is a mutual respect when you do it that way. It really can be uplifting, but too often, Jonathan, it comes, it comes down to wrangling and contention. <laughs> so let's, let's look at So yes, we can. When we harbor thoughts and feelings of enmity or hatred, we prime ourselves to be more readily engaged in actions that bring strife. Those whom we should be caring for, we end up wrangling with, end up in contention with, and we don't want to go there. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3. I give you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not walking like mere men? The Apostle Paul is telling those in the church of Corinth that they are acting immaturely. He's saying, you're like kids. You should be above this behavior by now. They should have been progressing. To act this way uh, it causes strife, and it's an act that's driven by a deed of the flesh. And he's saying that if you are doing this, you're acting like regular human beings, and that's not acceptable for followers of Christ. So we have to think about this and say, wait, am I falling into this human being activity, or am I walking in a way that, that follows after Christ? What does strife bring us to? A dead end of humanly driven and destructive personal relationships. 1 Corinthians 1.11 For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. It's interesting to me how the apostle brings up periodically that, okay, look, there's, there's strife, there's contention. You've got to do something about that. You've got to handle that. This is not a good thing. He's continually doing that, and he's encouraging us, Jonathan, to make sure that we handle things, hey, here's an idea, as mature Christians, not just as human beings who have different opinions. So when we look at the, the idea of enmities, you know, the hostility and strife, the question is, are, am I rising to a spiritual life, or am I falling into human depravity by following these things? To be actively engaging in strife, is to be actively engaging a deed of the flesh. Experiencing strife, especially with those we are called to love as brethren, is an outward manifestation of a heart that has kept a door open to enmity. And I think that's the key. The hostility keeps a wedge in that door. And by having that hostility and that enmity grow and grow, it makes strife much easier to accomplish. And sometimes there are things that we don't want to have as easy to accomplish. Another mirror question, am I a catalyst for causing disagreement to push my point of view? Romans 12, 14 and 16. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. I love the way the apostle said it so many different ways in those few, few verses. Don't be haughty, associate with the lowly, don't be wise in your own estimation. He's making point. Do we get the point? Do we get the hint? Do we understand that following after a strife, a quarreling, isn't something productive? So, Jonathan, fruit of the Spirit. What fruit of God's power and influence, what fruit of the Spirit can help us to overcome strife? All right, remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'll choose kindness for this one. If we fill our life with kindness, we will have no room for the anxiety that goes along with strife and quarreling. I often sing that song, Try a Little Kindness, to help keep my focus. Yeah, see, now you can sing songs all you want, and people listen to you, and they think, oh, that's nice. When I try to sing a song, they say, that's not kind. <laughs> Not true, brother. Not true. <laughs> anyway, anyway, you know, it, it, it's so important to, to take the fruit of the Spirit and say, let me use something to, to diffuse what's happening here. So we've talked about these first two interpersonal relationship pieces, hostility or enmity and strife. Hostility internally brings strife externally. So what's next? Well, continuing in the third category, uh, remember, these are interpersonal relationships, enmity, strife jealousy, and outbursts of anger. So we saw how enmity 
can bring, bring strife. Now as we look further at our personal relationships, remember that one-on-one kind of thing, we will see how jealousy can bring outbursts of anger. What is being focused on? Jealousy. And jealousy means punitive zeal, an envious and contentious rivalry, jealousy as of a husband or wife. Now, enmity is hostility based on differing perspectives. Jealousy is a negative sense, is a deep emotional engagement based upon a desire to get even or punish or outshine another. So you have this enmity and hostility and jealousy, and they are two different things. They're two different things. The, the hostility is perspective-based. Jealousy is personally based. But it's against another person or another group of people. So we need to put it in its proper order. Let's look at James three fourteen to 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Now, Rick, just an observation. Rick, um, jealousy seems to have this sense of arrogance. Yeah, you know, and and the funny thing about it is oftentimes when you're jealous of somebody, you see them as arrogance, as arrogant. But really what we have is I'm being arrogant by making that judgment about them. I don't know what's in their heart. I can't judge that, and yet we do. And so, yes, it does have a very strong sense of arrogance, and it's very dangerous to us as Christians. For more on jealousy and envy and how they corrupt our hearts, see episode 1085, Am I a Jealous Christian? Go to ChristianQuestions.com or the CQ app and enter the episode number into the search bar. What does jealousy bring us to? A dead end of human, godless relationship destroying emotions. Ouch. The, yeah, I know. The oh, context man. of this next scripture is when Peter was thrown into prison, Acts 5, 17 and 18. But the high priest rose up along with his associates, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. Can you imagine this? Peter, I, now, I don't know what they said. This is a Rick opinion on, on the situation, but the scripture says they were filled with jealousy. They're probably looking at him, and again, my perspective on this, saying, he's a fisherman. Who does he think he is talking about God's word, talking about this guy, Jesus, and, and performing miracles and standing out there? And who does he think he is, this fisherman defying us? You know, there was this jealousy, and that jealousy, you can see the arrogance in that. And they put him in jail. They wanted him and the apostles to stop. Folks, we can't go down that road. It is a horrid, horrid road for us to be walking down. So when we look at jealousy, are we rising to a spiritual life or are we falling into human depravity? To be jealous is to dwell on petty emotions that have powerful influence on our actions. This deed of the flesh keeps our minds captive to a narrow interpretation of how we feel instead of giving us the latitude to apply such strong emotions to godliness and productivity. Jealousy is petty. It really is. When we are talking about following Christ, to be jealous is petty, and it gives a narrow way for your life, to, for, for you to process things that is not positive and not scriptural. Another mirror question? When I get jealous, what do I do with my petty emotions? Yeah, well, then that's a good question. What do I do? Because it's petty. We have to be clear on that. We need to understand. You know, jealousy is something that has a positive side to it. So let's take the emotion of jealousy and apply it to a positive activity. And you think, wait, we've just made jealousy all about being petty and all wrong, but there's something positive here. Let's look at two scriptures to help us understand that. John 2, 17. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And Romans 12, 11, Not lagging behind in diligence, 
fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So the word zeal, the zeal for your house has consumed me, and the word fervent in Romans 12, 11, those are both the same word for jealousy, different forms of, of the same word. So it's that same strong emotion, but it's being jealous for God to represent him appropriately, to do the things that we're supposed to do, to put our best efforts forward because we are have that emotional drive behind it. So there's a positiveness to this, but we have to work on it because the motivation for jealousy is usually very dark and very negative. So we can't just say, well, I'm just going to be jealous for God. We have to be jealous for God in a really positive, Jesus-like way. Rick, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome jealousy? All right, so overcoming jealousy, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. For this point of jealousy, I'm going to choose faithfulness. We need to be jealous for God. In other words, faithful to Him. And any time that we are not acting in accordance with that faithfulness, we need to be jealous for God. We need to be jealous for Jesus, for walking in His footsteps, not outside of His footsteps. We need to be jealous for a life of, life of sacrifice, that if I'm not doing that, I'm jealous that my time has not been spent in the right way. We need to be jealous for service, service to God, service to Christ, service to the brotherhood, because that's the way we're supposed to be. So I think there's something positive there. To help your children learn the fruit of the Spirit, check out our CQ video, What is the Fruit of the Spirit? Now we're still in Category 3, interpersonal relationships, enmities, strife, jealousy, and outbursts of anger. So we've seen how enmity or hostility feeds strife. And now we're going to focus on how jealousy feeds anger. Unfortunately, this is all too easy to predict. You know, this is not something you're going to say, wow, Jonathan, Rick, you really thought this one up. No, this is, a, 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 this is an obvious end result, and it's not a good one. So, Jonathan, let's go. What is being focused on? Anger. Anger is defined as passion, heat, anger, boiling up, the wine of passion. While jealousy is an inter-emotion uh, and reaction, Anger is a blatant and passionate outward expression. When anger is spurred on by the heat of jealousy, it usually brings disaster. Yeah, see, jealousy burns up and wells up on the inside, and anger bursts on the outside. And that's why the scripture is written, but it brings bursts, bursts of anger, expressions of anger. What does anger bring us to? A dead end of godless words and actions that are meant to hurt or destroy. Colossians 3, 5, 8, and 9. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self and its evil practices." You've laid aside the old self. You've put it behind you. Put wrath, that's the word for, jealous, for anger here, put that aside with all of these other things. They don't belong to us anymore. We've given them up. They are something from the past, and the past is not the present. So, Jonathan, rising up to a spiritual life, or are we falling into human depravity? While being driven by anger with passion is not always related to jealousy, it is always a sign of a heart in trouble. This kind of anger is never seen in a positive light for humanity in the New Testament and therefore is a deed of the flesh that is simply off limits. And this is important to understand. It's a heart that's in trouble. If we, are, if we get angry, we have to look inside of ourselves and say, what is driving that and what can I do about it? Mirror question, do I have anger in my heart that hurts others? And with anger, Jonathan, it comes down to, and we've talked about this in the past and uh, many, many times, the idea of something happens and we have a reaction. Then there's a space and then we can respond. We don't have to follow that initial reaction. We can pause, consider, and become Christ-like in our response. That's the way that we can handle uh, something like uh, anger and jealousy and, and outbursts of anger. All of these things, that's how we handle those things. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You can choose to act in anger, or you can choose to act in kindness and tenderheartedness and forgiving, because we've been forgiven. So Jonathan, what fruit of the Spirit can help us overcome anger? Well, remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So I'm going to choose gentleness. This one I need a lot of work on. I tend to be abrupt when I'm in a, what I call a, a, a work mode. You know, we need to follow the example of Jesus, who was meek and humble in heart. We need to value everyone so anger is kept in check. And you can be working hard and focused and still be gentle. So I really like that, that correlation with the gentleness against the anger. There's, there's cause and effect here. Hostility and strife, jealousy, and angry outbursts. These are deeds of the flesh. We've got to be careful. Our hearts and minds are powerful influencers when it comes to how we treat each other. Let's be aware. So our personal relationships are easily subject to the deeds of the flesh. What about our larger group relationships? Even though the dynamics of Christian group relationships are different from those of Christian personal relationships, the dangers are the same. Human ego and perspective are simply not spiritual, which means that we all must be on guard against our own nature. As we will see, the things we need to be aware of can be subtle and easily rationalized by human perspective. So. It comes down to focusing, realizing, and acting. Now on to our fourth category, group relationships, verses 20 and 21. Disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying. With this next category of group relationships, Paul uses a very revealing word to put the importance of appropriately handling our group relationships in order. And this is where we're beginning. What is being focused on? Disputes. It is defined as by implication, faction, electioneering, or intriguing for office. You know, the best way to describe it is self-promotion. And this word seems to have a much broader meaning than many translations give it. It carries the sense of being, putting oneself forward for the purpose of getting people to follow and support you. All right, so that's something that we have to to watch out for. So where it says disputes, you you don't get that sense, but that's really what it means, that self-promoting. What does disputes or self-promoting bring us to? A dead end of human self-glorifying focus that minimizes godliness and accentuates ego. Now, let's reread James 3, 14 through 16, but change the focus from jealousy to selfish ambition. But you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. In selfishly promoting ourselves, we have forgotten our Christian character development of selflessness. Yeah, and and you think about it, it you're, you're you're forgetting selflessness, so you're forgetting nothing. You can, you can rationalize, well, I'm forgetting nothing, so forgetting nothing is a good thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But right. it's all wrong, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Selfish ambition, self promoting, doesn't work as a Christian. James in this verse, uh, chapter three, verses fourteen to sixteen, he combines jealousy, which is generally focused on one-on-one issues, and selfish ambition, which is generally focused on positioning oneself within a group. So he puts them together. He's showing us that focusing on ourselves at any level is never a good idea. Ever a good idea. Selfish ambition, no. Christ likeness, yes. Am I rising to a spiritual life? in what I'm doing here, or am I falling into human depravity? To be self-promoting is to be self-honoring, and that means we have taken what belongs to God for our own use. Such an approach is always categorized in Scripture as a deed of the flesh. To be spiritual is to walk away from such things. And when you think about it, you think about who was the first being to take what belonged to God for his own use. Lucifer. 
For sure. Absolutely. So we can have him as our model or Jesus as our model. Take your time. I mean, really, take your time. Which direction do we want to be going? Let's look at, uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan, I know you have a mirror question. I do indeed. You always do. Do do (laughs) I ever promote myself instead of God when it is he who is working through me? You know, promoting ourselves, being a Christian is to be representative of something very big and very powerful, and that's good. But let's make sure the, the promotion's in the right place because the leader's job has already been taken. We're followers, so we need to promote God through Christ as we follow. Let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing for selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So the idea, again, don't promote me. I shouldn't do that. It's never beneficial for anybody. The focus always has to be on Christ. Well, Rick, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome disputes or self-promotion? Well, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I'm going to choose for this self-promoting, I'm going to choose self-control. Instead of promoting self, control yourself. Promoting of anything is outside of our jurisdiction. Don't promote yourself. Control yourself to be subservient to the will of God and to following in Jesus' footsteps. It takes work. It takes a refocus. But it certainly brings us something very good. Still in the fourth category, group relationships, disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying. So while self-promotion is not the only cause of dissension in the body of Christ, it's a very willing participant. It wants to be right there in front. Okay, here I am. Pick me. Here we go. What is going to be here, our— Pick me, Jonathan. Here we go. I'm important here. Uh, excuse me. What, what is no, being but, focused uh, but, but pick me. You, you keep interrupting me. <laughs> well, it's, see, see the problem of self-promoting? You see, it just doesn't work, does it? Okay, go ahead. No, it doesn't. I'm going to go now. All right. Okay. What is being focused on? Dissensions. This means disunion. That is figuratively dissension. You know, by definition, any true brotherhood cannot survive when there are dissensions. And that's such a powerful statement. If you have a true brotherhood, dissensions are going to break it apart from the inside out. So we need to be really, really, really clear about that. Well, what do dissensions bring us to? A dead end of human and godless bickering over those things which should be decided in love and tolerance. Uh, Romans 16, 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings which you learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. By their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. See, this is very powerful. You, you defined dissensions as disunity and all of that. And, and the apostle says, for those who cause that, stay away from them, because this is a poison. It's a poison within Christianity. We need to be clear about what we're following. Paul leaves no question as to the inappropriateness of dissensions within the body of Christ. They just don't belong. So we look at dissensions. Am I rising to a spiritual life or am I falling into human depravity? To contribute to dissensions among the brotherhood is to damage the bonds of fellowship that hold us together. Jesus taught us to wash one another's feet, not to walk away from one another. That's a powerful lesson that he taught. And uh, it's hard to say what the most powerful lessons were, Jonathan, of Jesus, but I got to say that that the washing of the disciples' feet has got to be in the top five or so. Something very powerful, very humble. He was the leader, and he came to serve. Another mirror question. Do I in any way use fleshly power to break the brotherhood instead of building them up. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Our love has to be without hypocrisy. 
And when you take the hypocrisy out, the tendency toward these dissensions can start to dissolve away. We have to keep things in order. So, Jonathan, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome the tendency toward dissensions? Well, remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm going to pick love. We need to have patience and understanding with others. If we don't, it not only robs us of peace and love in our hearts, but it robs us of relationships with others. And so remember now we've got self-control, or I'm sorry, not self-control. We've got self-promotion and dissensions. Those are the two things. And you can see how they're connected. When you promote yourself, you end up creating dissensions. And so we need to understand that there's a cause and effect in these, in these deeds of the flesh, and we need to be on our guard. So self-promotion and dissensions, what, what's next? Back to the fourth category, group relationships, disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying. So if allowed to flourish, self-promotion and dissensions attract a separate party mentality. And I'll tell you, that is not something that is based in Christianity. What is being focused on? Factions. We define factions as choice that is specially a party or abstractly disunion. As human beings, we gravitate towards those we are in most agreement with. As Christians, we are to gravitate towards those of our same faith and conviction. So the idea of factions is the is a party mentality. And when you look at when you look at the political realm of the world, you have parties, you have different different groups that stand for different perspectives. Christianity is not supposed to be modeled after those things. We're not supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be rising above those things. Faction, factions, party mentality is not Christian. What do factions bring us to? A dead end of human decision that brings earthly-based division where there should be none. Second Peter 2, 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you who will secretly induce destructive heresies or factions, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So you can see that factions are destructive. Peter is talking about it in very, very straightforward terms. You've seen the Apostle Paul in one of the previous Deeds of the Flesh saying, avoid them, and now we're with factions, and says these are destructive factions, destructive disunion, even denying the master who bought them. So we're, we're, we've been looking at disputes, d- dissensions, and, and factions, and see how they all work together and bring us to a place where you suddenly don't recognize your Christianity anymore. You're, you're looking and say, wait, this isn't what the original model was. This is not how the early church worked. Where do we go wrong? Are we rising to a spiritual life, or are we falling into human depravity? To be a part of a faction is to be walking according to the deeds of the flesh. The body of Christ is not divided. When called to this body, we have no business building human-based ways of customizing our discipleship to fit our own group mentalities. The body of Christ is one body. It's very specific. It's very clear. There's one head, and that's Jesus, period. Mirror question. Do I in any way support customized Christianity? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. (laughs) <laughs> I, I love the scripture because it talks about the building up of the body. And Jonathan, I occupy, by God's grace, a little teeny tiny part of that. But that my little teeny tiny part, if appropriately used, can be really put to work in helping the rest of the body to grow. That's our job, to support one another, to be part of this so we are following the instructions of Jesus. We have to avoid these destructive heresies, this disunion, because that is not godly. Well, Rick, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome factions? Fruit of the Spirit, 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I'm going to choose faithfulness for dealing with factions because faithfulness discourages the self-promotion that we started with. Faithfulness calms the dissensions that that grows into, and faithfulness seeks to dissolve the factions because they're not Christ-like. We're being faithful to that which is higher, not faithful to that which we feel, and there's a big difference between those two things. So to be called to discipleship is to be called away from the human organization, the way the human organizations work, and to the simplicity of Jesus as our head. Our human and group relationships can easily be misdirected. What is the last piece of that misdirection puzzle? Before we get to the reckless behavior category of the deeds of the flesh, we need to touch on a potentially sinister result of our self-promotion, dissensions, and factions. It's envy. As we will see, envy is just like all the other deeds of the flesh that we're supposed to walk away from as it is a tool of Satan and is used to keep us from rising up to Christ-likeness. Here's the thing. Envy stunts your spiritual growth. It stunts it. It takes it and, it and it makes it so the growth slows down and stops. We're still in the fourth category, group relationships, disputes, dissensions, factions, and envying. What is being focused on? Envying. Envying is described as ill will, jealousy, and spite. Jealousy is that internal emotion that sees what someone else has or does and wants it for themselves. Envy takes things a step further and wishes others ill will because they seemingly have what we want. So jealousy is one thing, envy is another thing. And the key to envy, key, you're like you want this. You don't want to open this door. But the, the, no, key, please don't. <laughs> the key to envy is the sense of wanting ill will, something bad to happen to somebody else. That's what envy is. What does envy bring us to? A dead end of human and godless desire for others to suffer simply because they have or are something that we are not. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine confirming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy or ill will, strife, abuse of language, evil suspicions and constant friction between men and depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain man we have read so many awful lists in these last two podcasts Whew. but but you know what folks it's important because we're looking at these deeds of the flesh and the apostle paul puts them all together in these scriptures in Galatians, so we can understand them. So here we're looking at envying. Envy, ill will, is easily spurred on by an earthly approach to spiritual things. And in that last scripture, you had all of these other things, a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words and, and so forth. That's what ill will brings. And so we have to be aware so we can stay away. Well, Rick, this reminds me of the subject of road rage. Mm. Whenever someone cuts me off off the road, I, I, I try first to say, thank you, Lord, for preventing an accident and keeping us safe. Then I pray he doesn't cause an accident ahead of us and hurt anyone. I strive not to hold on to any ill will against them. You know, and, and that's an important process because you, you're thankful and then you're prayerful. Whenever we're dealing with any of these things, being thankful and being prayerful for what is, in terms of godliness, is a real good way for us to refocus ourselves. You know, that, that, that reaction, pause, and response. It's a good way to reset ourselves so we can fight these things because they're natural to imperfect humanity. We need to be aware of it. So, again, we're looking at envy or ill will. Am I rising to a spiritual life or am I falling into human depravity? Envy, wishing ill will on another is never a standalone deed of the flesh. It always needs some other thought or emotion to provoke it. If we ever feel envy or ill will against anyone, 
It is a signal that something deeper has gone astray in our spiritual lives. These things need our immediate and honest attention. See, there are certain deeds of the flesh that when they're happening on the inside, they signal something, and they signal something is very, very wrong. And if we can be humble enough to say, wow, I feel this way, what's wrong? What's causing it? And then begin to dig. That's where we can really begin to start to change things. A mirror question. Do I wish ill will on anyone for any reason? 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy or ill will and all slander like newborn babes, like for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So what you see is, again, a different perspective. Putting aside malice and deceit and hypocrisy and ill will and slander. Put those aside. And it's interesting that the apostle says that, and then he goes back to the basics, like newborn, ba- newborn babes long for the basics, the beauty of the truth that, that first drew you. It's a process. It's a, it's a way to put things in order so you're not wishing ill will, but you're looking upwards and, 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 and looking for God's blessing. Pray for those who persecute you, like Jesus said. We're looking at envy as part of this fourth category of group relationships. Jonathan, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome envy? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, I'll choose joy. Instead of going down that road of ill will for others, think about the blessings and opportunities we have in Christ. We know that things will be difficult. But Jesus had no ill will. And in Nehemiah 8.10, it says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yeah, and that's such a powerful thing. Jesus had no ill will to anyone. And if anybody had a, quote, right, unquote, to ill will, it would have been Jesus. But he died for everyone. He didn't have ill will. He had God's will for them, and he died for for them. So we've looked at self-promotion and dissensions. You see how those go together and they produce factions and ill will comes out of all of that. There's this process and it's dark and it's nasty. I hate to ask, but I'm going to ask anyway. So what's next? Well, let's move on to the fifth category, reckless behavior. Verse 21, drunkenness and carousing. What is being focused on? Drunkenness. Drunkenness simply means an intoxicant. Now, we understand this drunkenness to mean being intoxicated with alcohol primarily, but also including anything else that would mar our ability to think clearly and act soberly. Basically, our mind is clouded. Right. So with a clouded mind, and alcohol is a great example of, of having a clouded mind, uh, And and but the point of this, as we'll see, is that cloudiness in our spiritual thinking doesn't just come from alcohol. What does drunkenness bring us to? A dead end of human carelessness that trades our sobriety for a momentary escape, only to find that this escape was actually a major snare of the flesh. And that is one of those things that happens to people all the time. We get stuck and we look for the out, and then we look back and say, boy, that decision was worse than the thing I was running away from. And this is this idea of drunkenness is important. And again, it's not just alcohol. And we're going to illustrate that by what Jesus says. he's, He's talking to his followers about the end times. And here's what he says in Luke 21, 34 to 36. Be on the guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So the idea here is Jesus is saying, don't be weighted down. Don't let your hearts be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness, with being, with being uh, focused on other things and with being cloudy of mind, of spiritual mind, when you're living at such a time. When there's so much happening and so much difficulty, don't allow the cloudiness of humanity to infiltrate your spiritual mind. 
The end times bring some testings that are common and some testings that are unique to that period. The point is, we as Christians need to avoid anything that clouds our minds from spiritually sound thought and action. So we look at this idea of drunkenness, not just physically, but in in a spiritual and a a mental sense. Am I rising to a spiritual life or am I falling into human depravity? Drunkenness or any lack of sobriety is a choice. When we allow ourselves to be subverted by this deed of the flesh, we are engaging in a compromise of our ability to walk in the spirit. Such compromises can come across as small as a just this once event or a no one gets hurt rationalization. In reality, it walks us away from Christ. Are we walking toward Christ or walking away from Christ? Drunkenness walks us away. We're cloudy and it doesn't work. A mirror question. Do I in any circumstance compromise and allow my thinking to become clouded? Romans 13, 12 through 14. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Well, Rick, what fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome drunkenness? Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I'm going to choose goodness to have that higher, clearer level of thinking, that clean level of thinking, that striving for that which is pure, which is from above, because James says the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. That's what can help us. Goodness can help us to say, I'm avoiding anything that makes me cloudy because I want to focus on that only which is good. What's next? Fifth category, reckless behavior, drunkenness, and carousing. What is being focused on? Carousing. And it means as if letting loose. While drunkenness and lack of sobriety can be private sins, carousing is a public and reckless expression of a lack of sobriety. So what we want to understand is some of these things happen on the inside And some of these things happen on the outside. And carousing is very definitely a very physical picture of being, in a a sense, out of control and not in a godly state of mind or action. What does carousing bring us to? A dead end of human carelessness that displays our lack of sobriety for all to see. It identifies us as a partier and not as a disciple of Christ. 1 Peter 4, 2 through 4. Live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you did not run with them in the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. Well, Rick... I have to say, I had all these negative qualities in my past, and that was my way of life with my friends. I look back in disgust and shame, thinking, how could I have ever gone down that road? But when, by God's grace, I I changed my life, all my friends and some of my family looked at me like I was going off the deep end. It shows you how backwards this world really is. It really does. It really does. And, and, you know, and, and the key, Jonathan, is you, you say you look back on that with shame and disgust. And that's one of the keys to overcoming the deeds of the flesh, to label them as what they are in relation to our Christ-likeness. So that's a powerful, powerful tool, that tool of labeling. So when we look at these things, are we rising to a spiritual life or are we falling into human depravity? It is fitting that the Apostle Paul ends this list of the deeds of the flesh with carousing. This is a list of contrast. You once did these things, and now you don't. To be a partier exemplifies what being in the world sees as acceptable. Christian sobriety demands that we walk away from such things. There's a demand here, and the demand is walk away. Mirror question. 
do I publicly display cloudiness, which could call into question my discipleship? Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What we have is a very clear picture of leaving certain things behind and moving on to things that are ahead. Leave it behind, label it for what it is, and walk away. So, Jonathan, this is our final deed of the flesh. What fruit of God's power and influence can help us overcome this carousing? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I'll pick patience. Philippians 4, 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. We cannot follow the crowd, and of course, this also takes self-control. We need to be patient with ourselves as we strive to be more in the image of Christ. So, patience. And why is that such a good fruit of the Spirit here? Because sometimes things don't change immediately. You have to work the change, you have to make it become the new habit, and then walk with Christ, just like we've been talking about for these last two podcasts. So, after Paul, after the Apostle Paul states examples of all these categories, these 15 things, he covers anything he may have missed, at the end of the verse says, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God We are to be clear and focused to understand wrong is wrong, and there is no middle ground. We have navigated through a long and difficult list of 15 deeds of the flesh. In so doing, we have plainly seen that our sensuality, our spiritual loyalty, our personal and group relationships, and our general behavior all must be in line with the principles of of sacrificial discipleship. So how do we develop these profound and life-changing principles? We develop it through the fruit of the Spirit. Our next episode will clearly open up this fruit so we can apply each and every aspect to better live as true disciples of Jesus. And folks, that's what this is about. It's about better living as a true disciple of Jesus. It's about making clear-cut decisions, walking away from sin, walking toward godliness. And next episode, we are opening up the gold mine, the fruit of the Spirit. I can hardly wait to get there. Think about it. Folks, we love hearing from our listeners. We welcome your feedback and questions from this episode or other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. And again, coming up in our next episode, Do I Walk in the Spirit or the Lusts of My Human Nature? Part 3, Bring on the Fruit of the Spirit. Talk to you next week. <laughs>